Mm, great message in that song. Thank you, Taylor. Sure appreciate it. It's good to be in church, amen? Happy Sabbath, everyone. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for this time that we can come apart from the busyness of life and gather together with other like-minded worshipers and come into your presence and just worship you. We thank you for the gift of music and we thank you for the gift of our church family. And Lord, just now, as we're entering the, the sermon portion of our worship service, I pray that you will help us to lay aside everything that would distract us and just give you our attention so that you can have your way with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, this morning, I've entitled the message, <clears throat> Tithes and Offerings. This is actually the fourth message in the series on stewardship that we started. I know we've had a couple of other standalone sermons uh, interspersed throughout but we are continuing this series. So far, we have covered personal devotion, Sabbath keeping, interpersonal relationships. So today, we're going to deal with tithes and offerings. And um, as you know, we, we read in the opening passage to bring all of the tithes into the storehouse, right? And we read that precious promise that so many people know. Many of you have it memorized, I'm sure. Such a wonderful, precious promise about bringing the tithes in and then the, to see if the Lord will do what? Pour out a blessing for us. How big? So big that you can't even, you, not receive it, but hold it, contain it, right? All right, so we're going to talk about tithes and offerings, and I, and I want to get into um, really the, the heart of the issue. Um, I want to start out today by pointing out that when human beings are born, they are born utterly dependent, right? I mean, absolutely, they have to have everything done for them. They can't do anything for themselves. They are absolutely, utterly dependent and very self-focused. And it's not long as a child grows and, and learns to speak before they learn some words that are very, very common. I, I, I think I, I would, if I was a betting man, I would bet that every kid eventually says this. It's mine. It doesn't take long for people to come to the point in their development as a human being to learn the idea of possessiveness, does it? It's mine. But thankfully, thankfully, we grow out of that and then we're not selfish anymore, right? <laughs> oh, I would like that to be the case, but you know, you know, earlier, before we read the promise, if we go back to that passage, it has something to say. And so I'm going to have you turn with me. If you brought your Bible today, could you say amen? amen? Very good, very good. Then open up your Bible with me to Malachi chapter 3. Malachi is the last book of the Old Testament just before the Gospel of Matthew. Malachi chapter 3. And um, we're going to read um, the passage, verses 7 through 10. So if you're there, would you please say amen? amen. All right, so beginning in verse 7, it reads, Yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. Return to me. And I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we, we return? Will a man rob God? Yet you have robbed me. But you say, in what way have we robbed you? In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me. 
even this whole nation. So that's what preceded, preceded the uh, precious promise that we opened up with in our reading. Now let's go on and read verse 10. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such a blessing that there will not be room enough to, re to receive it. So, I want to just take a closer look at this passage. First of all, God says, return to me and I will return to you in this passage, right? And since it says return to me, that indicates that they've gone away. By the way, you realize that the Bible tells us all we have gone astray like sheep, right? Okay, return to me and I will return to you. And then they asked, in what way shall we return? And then God asked the question, will a man rob God? And then he says, yet you have robbed me. And then he goes on and he says, in what way? They, they say, what way have we robbed you? And he says, in tithes and offerings. Right? In tithes and offerings. Now, first of all, I want to point something out. <clears throat> you cannot rob something from someone that doesn't already belong to them. Do you understand what I'm talking about here? Okay, um, he says we've been, we have robbed him in tithes and offerings. I, I want to ask you something. What does tithe mean? Tenth, a tenth, 10%, ten percent, right? A tithe means tenth. So 10%, uh, if, if I've then got a hundred bucks, how much of that is God's? A hundred bucks. I know it's a little bit of a trick question, but not really. It's just the way that we process things. We tend to think of, if I got a hundred bucks, well, you know, 10 of that belongs to God. No, a hundred of it belongs to God. He's the owner of it. He's just entrusted it to me as a steward, amen? Come on, church, amen? amen. So, that's why he can say, in tithes and offerings you have robbed me. Because he was the owner of it to begin with. So I want to talk about some things. You see, with tithes and offerings, and as we look at every issue that we've looked at in this Faithful Stewardship series, it always is boiling down to something. It's, it's not just these standalone uh, practices that we should have as Christians. These are all part and parcel of a covenant relationship that we are entering into with God. And God has a part, and I'll tell you something, in God's part of the covenant relationship, he is faithful 100% of the time. He is never, ever unfaithful in his covenant relationship with you and I. But you and I have room to grow in our faithfulness to him, don't we? Church, what do you think? Yes? yes. Amen. So I want to point out that tithes and offerings deal with the issue of this covenant relationship. And the first thing that I want to point out is that we need to acknowledge who God is. So turn with me to Psalm 24. Psalm 24. If you're there, please say amen. All right. And I'm just going to read verse 1. Psalm 24 in verse 1 says that the earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. So how much belongs to God? Everything. The earth and everything that is in it, including everyone that's in it. Because you are not your own. You've been bought with a price. Amen? So literally, he owns everything. Everything. And we need to acknowledge that. 
Not just in passing, oh, yeah, that's right, I see that. No, what I'm saying is we need to come from a perspective of the way we approach life in realizing that God owns everything. Secondly, I want to point out in Psalm 50, just turn a few pages over to Psalm 50, and when you're there, please say amen. I'm going to wait for a few more. Psalm 50, if you're there, one more time, say amen. There we go. All right, and I'm going to read just verse 12. And it says here, If I were hungry, I would not tell you. For the world is mine and all its fullness. God is saying, I don't need anything from you. <laughs> you need something from me. I wouldn't tell you if I, I it's all mine. All right. Now let's go to Matthew, the Gospel of Matthew chapter 6. Gospel of Matthew chapter 6, and we're going to be looking just at verse 24. <clears throat> Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. When you're there, would you please say amen? All right. So Jesus is teaching here, and he says... No one, how many? No one. No one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. God and what? It says mammon here. What does that mean? Riches. You can't. Serve God in the pursuit of money. Listen. Is, do you know anyone who has made a God of pursuing money? Do you know anyone like that? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put it this way. What does it mean to really serve either God or money? What, how would you differentiate what does it mean to serve one or the other? To live for. Who said that? That's well said. To live for. I spend my time, my efforts, my resources, my focus in the pursuit of this. And if you can put dollar signs there as being the primary, there's probably a problem. There's probably a, now listen, I'm not saying we don't all have to make a living, right? I'm not saying that. But what I am saying is that people get confused about what is most important. And they give their job or their way of making a means the top spot in their life. And that is out of sorts. You can't serve God and do that. Not really. You can fake yourself out and think you are, but not really. Okay, so the first thing about tithing and giving offerings are that we acknowledge who God is. He owns everything. And this is a worship issue. I, I, I realize that you're God and you're my provider and that you have just entrusted some things to my stewardship and I will acknowledge that by returning to you a faithful tithe. I don't pay you a tithe. I return to you a tithe out of what you've given me. It's yours anyway. And I'm acknowledging that I realize your lordship as I return that tithe to you. Amen? Amen. All right, let's now move on to the fact that it's also a trust and obedience um, issue. Tithe and offering is a trust and obedience issue. So uh, with Proverbs chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, many of you have committed this to memory. It's a great principle for living. Trust in the Lord with what? All your heart. And lean not to what? 
your own understanding. Acknowledge him in all your ways, and then he will do what? Direct your paths. That's right. There is a principle. If you trust in the Lord with all your heart and don't lean to your own understanding, then if, if you acknowledge him in all your ways, then he will direct your paths. Amen? But these two things are diametrically opposed, trusting in the Lord or leaning to your own understanding. Why is that? Because of the principle that we keep returning to, that we keep grappling with in our life over and over again, which is your ways are not my ways. And, right? My ways are not your ways. Your, your ways are not my ways. My thoughts are not your thoughts. Right? As the heavens are above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts. So if I lean to my own understanding, there's no way I'm going to be in harmony with what God is doing because his ways are not my ways. And I'm going to be in big trouble if I keep leaning to my own understanding because there's a way that seems right unto a man, but the end thereof is the way of death. Oh, so it is about trusting God. Let's look to Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 33. Jesus just got telling, got done uh, telling everybody that they don't have to worry about what they're going to eat or what they're going to wear and that kind of daily provision stuff. And now we're in verse 33 and you get another life principle. And it says, but seek what? First, the, the kingdom of God. And also what? His righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. All what things? Just the daily provisions that we have need of, right? All the things that he was just talking about up here. The, what you're going to wear, what you're going to eat, that kind of thing. You don't have to worry about that if, if you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. But that can really go against what people are um, experiencing in, in their own cognition, in the way that they're rationalizing things. Because they're looking at the bills and the expenses as they're checking out what the month has. And they're looking at the, what they expect to be their income. And sometimes the expenses outweigh the income. And they're thinking, you know, I don't think I even have enough to pay the bills. But if I did just, you know, use some of the tithe, then I could pay this bill or that bill and everything would be okay. And, and you see, that's leaning to your own understanding, isn't it? That's getting off the path that God has called us to. It's easy to rationalize, though. It makes so much sense in our own minds. But God has a way for us to live, and it is to trust him. Do you know, do you know that it is impossible? I, I will, I believe this with everything that's in me. It is impossible for any one of us to make it into God's kingdom if we don't truly trust him. You can have all the good works you want, but if you do not truly trust in God, you won't be one of the people in his eternal kingdom. So we want to trust in him, amen? And let me ask you this. Do you think that he's worthy of being trusted? Absolutely. He deserves, he deserves our implicit trust. Unquestioning, right? Now let's look to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. When you're there, please say amen. All right, very good. We're going to look at verse 19. And I do love this promise here. It says, and my God shall do what? Supply all your need according to what? His riches. But, wait, wait a minute. What are his riches? He owns everything. Everything. My God shall supply all your need 
according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. We do not even begin to comprehend what kind of a promise this is because it reaches not only into our temporal needs, but it reaches into our eternal needs. Amen? All right. So the big thing that I want to get across in, in this part is that tithes and offerings is directly tied to, intertwined in the covenant relationship between God and man. It is about acknowledging who God is and who we are in relation to him. And it is also about trust and obedience. By the way, you can know something and believe that it's true. You can profess that it's true, but it's another thing to put it into practice, isn't it? That's where, that's actually how trust is demonstrated through obedience, you know? Okay. And to, be, to obey is better than sacrifice, isn't that right? Yeah. Amen. All right, so let's move along. We're going to read the passage in 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 6 and 7 here. 2 Corinthians chapter 9. When you're there, would you please say amen? amen. I'm going to give just another minute then. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, one more time if you're there. Amen. All right, very good. We're going to pick up in verse 6 and read through 7, okay? And it says this, But this I say, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And he who sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. I, I, I guess I want to pause and talk about this verse before we read the next one. Why is Jesus using the terminology of sowing and reaping? Be, it's not a trick question. It's an agrarian society. People are very familiar with agriculture. They know that if you're going to have a bountiful harvest, it's because you have sown a bountiful amount of seed. They're very aware of this. They realize that if you don't sow much seed, you're not going to get much in the harvest. They know this. Right? Does that make sense? So... The same principle applies when it comes to giving of the resources that God has given to us. If we sow sparingly, don't expect to reap bountifully. Right? All right. So, verse 7. So let each one give as he purposes in his heart. Not grudgingly, or of necessity, for God loves a what? A cheerful giver. A cheerful giver or a fearful giver? It was cheerful giver, right? God loves a cheerful giver. But I got to tell you that um, I have experience in being a fearful giver. And I'm not proud of that fact, but I have, I have remitted my tithe and I have thought as I was putting it in there. I was th just thinking, oh my goodness, how are we going to make it this month? What, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I would just have been that fearful. Has anyone else ever been there? Some of you, huh? I'll tell you what. When you put in that tithe and you know that even if it the finances don't add up when you try to do your budget, but you know that you're putting God first and you just let yourself trust in him. That is such a good feeling. And I'm going to tell you something. He has never let us down, has he, wife? We're coming up on 25 years of marriage. Four days be 25 years. I praise the Lord for my wife. Amen. So... Um, in, in all of that time, we've never been without what we need, ever. We have always had what we need. And it's not been because I've always been a great faithful steward. It's been because he who made the promises is faithful. 
But I tell you something, I am enjoying exercising a real faith and trust in living inside of his ordinances and the peace that comes with that and just being a faithful steward. There is so much personal peace that comes along with that. If you haven't experienced that, I want to invite you to do what verse 10 in Malachi chapter 3 says. Try him in this. And see if he won't open the doors and pour out for you such a blessing so much that you're not even able to receive it. You can't contain it. So, we should consider if we've been giving grudgingly or out of obligation or if we've really decided, you know, I'm putting my trust in the Lord. Because I believe there's a difference. I, I believe that there is a blessing that attends giving cheerfully and willfully uh, versus giving out of obligation and duty. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? The, the difference? It's really kind of the same thing that I was trying to get across with Sabbath keeping. If it's just a duty and an obligation, you're missing the joy of the, and the blessing that is in the Sabbath. It's the same thing with giving. All these things are tied to a unity with God that he's trying to draw us into to prepare us to live in eternity with him. But it is totally intertwined in this covenant relationship that is defined by a trust relationship. Am I making sense, church? Yes. All right. Definitely, we are dealing with a matter of heart. Let's go back to Matthew chapter 6. We did look at Matthew chapter 6 already, but we're going to go to an earlier part of the chapter and read verses 19 through 21. Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 through 21. Okay. Um, <clears throat> if you're there, would you please say amen? All right, so beginning in verse 19, it says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourself treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Okay, so... There's a, a very, very important concept in all of this. You see, God is using this practice of tithe and offering to build a trust relationship in us. He's cultivating trust in us. So, you know, I have noticed, and maybe you have too, that people tend to love things and use people. It's supposed to be the other way around. We're supposed to use things and love people. But people tend to love things and use people. It's a sad commentary, I know. But God wants us to be understanding that this is all about... We should not have our hearts set on things because things are of temporal value. This chair that is here, right here, this building that we're in, the car that you drove in, it is all going to be ashes one day. Isn't it? The clothing that you're wearing, if you've got eyeglasses, all of it's going to be ashes. Even the very elements will melt with fervent heat. Right? So all the things that we have that we call ours, and oh, I want to get on that for just a second. I just think about for a minute the things that you tend to call your own. My money, my car, my house, my wife, my kids, my, the list goes on. It's all God's. The car that I drive belongs to God. The money that I put in the offering plate today, it was his. The children that I have been privileged to raise, 
belong to him. It's all his. Possessions will pass away. And by the way, God does not need your money. He, does not, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, right? He does not need your money. In fact, we, we read, he said, if I was hungry, I wouldn't tell you. It's all mine anyways, right? So let's go to the important question of where is then your treasure? Where is your treasure? And we're, we're going to come to this Philippians uh, passage. So go ahead and open up there. But I want to uh, share a little story with you first. And I realize that some of you have heard me <clears throat> tell this story when you've been around for a little while. Some stories get repeated. So um, just bear with me. Um, there is a story about... Uh, Johnny Erickson Tata. Some of you may know her as a, a radio host of Christian programs. Um, she has a program called Johnny and Friends. And anyways, it's, it's encouraging scripture focused and sometimes music and stuff. Anyhow, Johnny is a quadriplegic, but she was not always so. That occurred because she had an accident diving into the water as a teenager. And she hit a rock when she dove into the water. And she has been a quadriplegic ever since. And she says that she has learned an awful lot about being needy from being a quadriplegic. And she says things that most everyone takes for granted, you know. When she wakes up in the morning, she has to wait until someone gets her out of bed. Then she waits for someone to get her dressed and comb her hair, brush her teeth. Things we really take for granted, right? She says she's really learned an awful lot about what it is to be truly just needy. She says when her husband wakes up in the morning to go to work, he gets out of bed and he leaves and she waits for her caretaker to come and get her out of bed and do all the things that we just talked about. She says sometimes when she's waiting for the caretaker to come, she's thinking, you know, I know when she comes, she'll be expecting a smile from me. But there are mornings when I don't feel like I have a smile to give. And so I will pray to Jesus and say, Lord, can you give me your smile so that I can share it with her when she comes? Just utter dependence. So Johnny was talking about a, a mission trip that she went on. She went on a mission trip to Ghana, and she had an escort who would push her around in her wheel, wheelchair to these remote villages. Um, anyhow, she said that when they were in this one remote village, she was being pushed down the road, and she noticed when they got to the marketplace that there was like gutters with raw sewage in it. It was an open-air market, so the, the meat that was hanging there had flies all over it and everything. And, and there was dog dirt on the, on the road and everything. And, and she noticed that a, a, a man came out of an alleyway, and he, and he crawled out, and he grabbed a hold of a piece of partially eaten fruit that had been laying on the ground and just began to eat it. And, and as she was taking this all in, she said she felt absolutely overwhelmed at the conditions that these people were living in, you know, just really, really very different from anything she had seen before. And she was, she began weeping just because of the conditions. And finally, the gentleman who was escorting her, pushing her around in the, in the wheelchair, said to her, you know, Johnny, 
I realize this is all a bit much for you. Would you like to go to, um, I'm going to call her Mary, Mary's house. She lives out on the edge of the village. Would you, would you like to go over and visit her? And she says, oh, yes, please, let's go. So he pushes her to the edge of the village. And at the edge of the village, there's a little footbridge over which he pushes her in the wheelchair. Once they get over the footbridge, he turns in back toward the stream they just went over. And there kind of under the bridge is this little makeshift hut made out of cardboard with a little tin door. And she thought, this, this couldn't be it, you know. But her escort says, here we are. And he steps up and he raps on that little tin door. And a second later, it opened. And there was a lady with a crutch who had polio. And she said, welcome. Welcome to Ghana. Welcome to Ghana where God is bigger because we need him more. And that really struck me. Because do they need God more in Ghana than we need him in the United States? No. We need him every bit as much. They just realize it more. Why do they realize it more? Because they're not as able to depend on their own finances and stuff like that to take care of their own needs. So they tend to look to themselves more. I mean, they tend to look to God more often where we tend to look to ourselves more often. But you see the point. My friends, finances are a blessing if they are, given, if they are used in the way that God intends. We must learn to be faithful stewards of that which he entrusts to us. We have to recognize where the treasure is. Remember, he's asking, where is your treasure? If your treasure is here, it's going to be taken from you. But if you are investing in God's kingdom, you have great riches to come. Amen? So let's look to Philippians chapter 3. And I'm going to begin reading in verse 17 and read through the end of the chapter. If you're there, please say amen. All right, beginning in verse 17 then. Brethren, join in following my example and note those who so walk as you have us for a pattern. I'm going to stop right there and just say that as Paul is addressing the church at Philippi, he's saying, you realize that we have came and provided leadership for you. You have seen how it is that we conduct ourselves. So follow us, follow our example and the people that you note that are also following our example. We should take note of what being faithful looks like and then emulate that. Amen? All right. Verse 18. For many walk of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ whose end is destruction who, and whose God is what? Come on, church. Whose God is what? Their belly. Do you think that people are so given to appetite that their God could be their belly? Hmm. I do too. And whose glory is in their shame, who set their mind, notice this, who set their mind on what kind of things? Earthly things. This is where we got to ask, where is your treasure? These people who Paul, as he's talking about them, is saying, even as I'm telling you about them, I'm weeping. They have set their mind on the things of the earth. Now, let's check out in, in verse 20. For our citizenship is where? It's in heaven. From which we eager, also eagerly wait for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body, that it may be conformed to his glorious body, according to the working by which he is able even to subdue all things to himself. Our citizenship is in heaven. See, that's what we need to remember. We need to remember that this is not our home. This is not our home. 
We are pilgrims passing through on our way to a heavenly country. Amen? Don't get too comfortable here. Don't try to build your kingdom here. Because if you invest all in this kingdom, guess what? You're going to lose everything that you have invested in. What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? All right, Matthew chapter 13, let's turn there. Matthew chapter 13. If you're there, please say amen. All right. And I am going to be reading verses 45 and 46. This is actually a parable, a two-verse parable that Jesus shared. Matthew chapter 13, verses 45 and 46. Beginning in verse 45, it says, Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price went and sold all that he had and bought it. Why am I finishing this whole talk with that little parable? Because my friends, in all your pursuits, in all your work, in all your attempt to gain and acquire, I want you to remember that the pearl of great price is Jesus Christ and his kingdom. Everything else, Paul says, I count everything else as what? As dung, as loss. It's, it's nothing to me. I have fixed my mind on the greatest gift of all. And that is Jesus Christ and his kingdom. I want you to know, friends, that today, as I stand here before you, I thank God that I'm having a, a good week. I, it's been a great week for me, and, and I praise Him for that. It's, I really feel blessed for that. I thank God for the beauty He's built into my life still, and, and the good relationships and so forth. But I got to tell you that I am not living for temporal joys. I am living for what is to come. I know what the pearl of great price is. And I am not willing to forfeit it for pursuing things of earthly gain. So listen, here I am in the church, here we are, all trying to serve God. We all have ideas about faithfulness. We've all done well and we've all not done not so well. And I'm not trying to talk about the idea of somehow we, we earn a merit with God. What I am saying, and I hope I'm saying it clearly, what I am saying is it all boils down to a pursuit and a faithfulness to a covenant relationship with Jesus Christ, a yielding to him and his word, following him, seeking after him, serving him, doing what he says, preparing to live forever with him. If we don't learn how to give faithfully now in the small things, what are we going to do when they're trying to take away everything that we have and say and choose? You choose, what are you going to do? If you want to buy or sell, you better make your choice right now. If you don't even know how to return to God, that which is already his, as he instructs in his word, what are we going to do? We need his help, amen? We need him to keep working on us, to renew our minds and transform our hearts and help us to be a people who are truly faithful stewards. And I hope that in this message today, I really truly hope that I have not in any way come across in a, like a point in the finger kind of way. I always feel like many fellows, one ship, we're in a fellowship together, right? All right. 
So we're going to close today with the hymn number 590, Trust and Obey. But I want to ask you something. If, if you believe that you can, you can grow in this um, area of stewardship and that you are willing to and want to say yes to Jesus in that, would, would you say amen right now? Amen. amen. Me too. Amen. Come on forward. Let's, let's sing this song. It's very appropriate for the message we've had today. Trust and...